Selwyn, I want to thank you so much for coming on and being willing to speak to me today. Uh, um, I want to start by asking you how you began to become interested in deliverance ministry and the supernatural work that you do today in general. Thanks, Stephen, for inviting me on. I'm really excited to chat to you. Um, you know, it all began, uh, you know, I tell people this, I'm a third generation pastor and my grandfather was a, such a wonderful example for me, but it began as far as I can remember, which is somewhere around five years old, I remember making a commitment to follow Christ. But I've always been, from a young boy, as far as I can remember, I've always been in love with Jesus, right? I can't explain that, but that's been my foundation. Just, you know, before I understood what the Bible is and all that stuff, I, I just saw Jesus through my grandfather. I just saw how he was with people and he was just such a wonderful man. And that was Jesus to me. So I got to identify with this concept of Jesus as this wonderful, loving person. So that's how it started for me. And then obviously as I became a teenager, I'd say around 15, 16, I just couldn't stop reading books. Um, and then around 17, I started getting into books uh, about spiritual warfare. I think my first books were Rebecca Brown's books, which uh, were four books. And I just couldn't put these books down. And, and a lot of Christians at that time were speaking quite aggressively against these books. In fact, a lot of Christian bookshops in South Africa at the time wouldn't stop them. And I remember when I migrated to Australia in 98, I joined a church in Perth. And uh, I gave these books to the pastor and his wife. I said, you've got to read these books. And anyway, about a month later, I asked them, how were those books? They said, no, we put it in the boot of our car. We were too scared to read them. So oh. I realized, and this was just the start. I just was so engulfed in learning about spiritual warfare, not knowing why. Uh, obviously, I knew from five years old, this is quite unusual. I knew from five I'd be a pastor one day. I just knew it. I desired it. I wanted to do it, but no idea about being an exorcist whatsoever. And things just led into that that world. Obviously, the first time someone's staying at my house, they're manifesting at 3 a.m. in the morning, and that's how it began. Wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's a very full-on uh, form of ministry that you're involved in. And I imagine it can be quite emotionally draining. So it's it's incredible that God equipped you with that call from a very, very early age. And so at what stage did you really begin to delve headlong into that and start basing a lot of what you were known for, at least online, around uh, the issue of deliverance? I've been doing deliverance for 20 years. But like I said, God hid a lot of stuff from me. He, he, he hid a lot of the extent to which this would go. And I think now in hindsight, I, I understand why, because maybe I would have just become, a, uh, it could have become a bit abnormal. You know, when you're younger and you're dealing with this kind of stuff, you know, there can be an imbalance. And obviously I'm, I'm 51 and more mature spiritually, so I can handle uh, the craziness of this, this deliverance world. But you know, he hid a lot of stuff from me and, and slowly groomed me into it, which is just amazing. But, um, yeah, I think about five years ago, believe it or not, doing it for 20 years, five years ago, I really, it clicked. And I went, you know what? I think I'm called to do this as a vocation, as a spiritual vocation. And that's when it sank in. And when it sank in five years ago, I just dived in deep. You know, and, and at the same time as that was happening, the Lord is bringing me more complicated possession cases so I was forced to research because a lot of stuff you deal with in this world when you're dealing with the demonic stuff's coming up that's in mythology and you don't know what it means so you have to research so the, at, I'll say about five years ago it started going really deep and um, working that way yeah excellent and one of the reasons I wanted to get you on is you have such an in-depth uh, knowledge uh, regarding all of this sort of stuff and so before we get into it and we get into some of these these stories and uh, some of your experiences around uh, exorcisms, I wanted to ask you, just for the sake of these skeptics, because obviously people are going to be watching this that aren't from a Christian background, that don't maybe believe what we believe about the Bible, and so they're going to be naturally quite skeptical of some of the things we're going to be talking about. And one of the main objections that people often raise is this issue of mental health issues. And so I wanted to ask you here, how do you personally know that what you're dealing with with the case of in the case of an exorcism isn't a mental health issue and that it's actually something else and it's supernatural 
Well, when something is psychological, uh, Stephen, it doesn't have the overtones that a supernatural issue has or something that's supernatural in nature. You know, um, the demonic for me is very predictable, whereas the psychological can be unpredictable. For example, if someone comes to you and says, you know what, I'm Joyce Meyer and I've been called to preach you're going to go, okay, that's psychological. If someone comes to you, I had someone come to me once and said, you know, I was, they, we, we were in Australia. I was playing with Led Zeppelin on stage last night in LA. And I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think that's possible because it takes X amount of hours to get there and back. So that kind of stuff, you know, things that are just not logically possible. But the psychological, what I tell people is, demonization or possession at whatever level it is is psychological this is where people get confused when i say this there's a strong psychological component to it because it's functioning in the psychology of the person in the person's mind construct in their state of consciousness which is where your psychology is but with psychological mental conditions they are also conditions separate to entities or spiritual diabolical powers and there could be two things going on so when i'm dealing with people because a lot of people believe it or not that have demonization struggle with depression bipolar borderline schizophrenia is becoming so common nowadays and so i separate the two you know i've seen in my own life i used to do support work here in australia so i used to work with uh, paranoid schizophrenics and I've seen people really, really benefit from uh, being on medication and, and that being something that's been good for them. How do you as a deliverance minister sort of understand medication? Because when you and I were speaking off camera, we were talking a little bit about how for some Christians, everything's demonic. And then for other Christians, nothing is. And you said that you kind of wanted to find a balance there. Um, so those are kind of, I suppose, two separate questions. Uh, you've kind of answered the first one already about how you determine what's demonic and what isn't. And obviously you believe in real mental health issues and you believe in the demonic. Yeah. But then to that second question, what what kind of view do you have on, on medication and psychiatry and things like that? Well, first, yeah, I think too many people are on medication. That's definitely out of balance. However, if there's, as I said, a pre-existing mental condition, they need medication. Otherwise, yeah. they're not going to have a, a good life. However, it's very rare that a demonic power does not take advantage of that and capitalize on it. So, again, comes back to the diagnosis. If I see the presence of demonic and a mental condition, as I said, they need to be on that medication for at least six weeks and until it's got enough time to create the balance that's needed. If there's demons and we drive those demons out and they are connected with the mental condition, then I tell the person, go back to your GP. If you're feeling more emotionally stable since the deliverance, go back to your GP and discuss with him whether he thinks he can slowly wean you off the medication to That's see in, in small increments so you can see whether you're coping without it. And that's how I do it. But I've heard ministers say, you should be off that medication. Get off it today. They've got off it today and they've ended up in hospital in the psych ward the next day. I've seen yep. this happen. So we've got to use wisdom. Yeah, I actually love that you just said that because, you know, one of the it's one of the reasons I wanted to have you on and not somebody else is I think that you really have a balanced, balanced view of it, which is excellent. You know, you're, you're saying that everything you're doing, the person's under the care of a qualified doctor, you know, they're under the care of psychologists mm. and psychiatrists. You're not anti that because I have seen, you know, blessed blessed people that i love brothers and sisters with mental health conditions you know come off them cold turkey because they've been told that that's what true faith looks like very and, dangerous uh, end up in psych wards like literally yeah. that happens and so the last thing we want to do in this podcast is tell people to do that i think what you've just said there you know if they're if they get a deliverance and then they're weaning off under the care of a doctor i mean that seems to be the most sensible thing you could possibly do so well, Stephen, God, God has given us doctors. He's given us psychologists. Because think about it. How many people out there will never go and get in a healing, spiritual healing through a church? So where do these people go? You know, True. I'll give you one more example. The, a man I was working with that had severe schizophrenia. So, you know, he'd come from an Indian Hindu background culture where, you know, they'd done a lot of fasting and all this kind of stuff. So I said to him, listen, he said to me, I want to come off the medication because the side effects are terrible. I said, listen, don't do that. 
So anyway, what he did without telling me, he just went cold turkey. And at the same time, he did a water fast. Two days later, he ended up in the psych ward, suicidal, almost took his life. And it took a, a few weeks for him to get back on track, back to the psychologist, back on medication. And about two months later, we were ready for more ministry. So, you know, I've just seen the effects of it. So we need GPs. We need these professionals. We've got to work together. And I and I know you work alongside qualified mental health professionals too. So mm. it, could you maybe speak to that a little bit for people that are experiencing uh, legitimate mental health issues and demonization? How do you typically address that? Like, do you handle one portion of it and then mental health professional handles the other portion? Uh, how do you understand those kind of that, that overlap, I suppose, in a person's treatment? If someone comes to me and said, I've been diagnosed with borderline by a professional and they're not on medication, I won't minister deliverance to them oh wow um that i will say to, and it's in my questionnaire it's in my profile form have you had a psychiatric assessment have they uh, diagnosed you have they put you on medication and there's quite a few people that come to me that clearly have spiritual issues have mental conditions and are not on medication and that can turn into a nightmare so and I, the reason why i say that is when the mind is unstable Stephen. The demonic is unstable mm. because you got to understand something. The demonic is very rational and very organized. What they propagate is the exact opposite. In the person's life, they propagate chaos. However, the demon itself is very logical and very organized and very calculated. So if the person's mind is unstable, you can't actually work deliverance through that situation because when the demon comes forward, you know, I call the demon forward and I speak to it directly. It's coming into their conscious state and it's using their psychological framework to communicate with you. Therefore, if that framework is unstable, it's not going to work very well. That makes complete sense. And I think you've got a, a really incredible approach to this. And so uh, sort of a follow-up question on that that I had here for you is, have you seen some uh elements of an exorcism that aren't explainable by a mental health issue you know so i know uh, exorcists sometimes have experiences where they might see someone speak in a language that they don't know or things that are you know obviously point to a supernatural origin for some of the issues that a person's suffering through i was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit i've encountered that many times where there's been a foreign language spoken uh i've just got so many examples um i've dealt with people that that I dealt with a Fijian Indian man that was born in Fiji and uh, had severe schizophrenia, right? He's, he's been on one of my newsletters because it's a wonderful testimony. Um, he, at one time we were dealing with him in a session, he spoke in this, which looked, sounded like a very ancient language. You know, you could say, okay, it's demonic tongues. Tongues sounds like gibberish. But this sounded like a language. So his mother was sitting with me. And after we completed this, for about 30 seconds, he just spoke in this dialect. We, his mother said to me, I said, that sounds like a kind of Greek, because I've heard Greek. And we went on YouTube, and there's actually a video on there that's um, got all the ancient languages put into linguistics. And we got to ancient Greek, and we both went, that, that, that's ancient Greek. And what we discovered is there's a possibility that his ancestors, because Alexander the Great, a lot of those warriors settled in India. In fact, there's a tribe in India called the Patan people. And they have Greek ancestry going all the way back to Alexander the Great. So very interesting. Another case I dealt with an Australian woman, fourth generation Australian, spoke in a Celtic language. And the reason why I understood it was Celtic is my mother's, my grandmother was Welsh. And she taught me a little bit of Gaelic when, when I was a child. And I went, that sounds like ancient Welsh. Anyway, so I've heard many of these things, uh, which are sometimes unexplainable. Sometimes the demon is speaking in that language. I've also heard Latin. And sometimes there's a dissociated part, an ancestral dissociated part from previous generations that spoke that language. That's really incredible. And so you see the uh, sort of linguistic side of, of demonic possession. Are there ever any physical feats that you've witnessed with your own eyes that you believe are supernatural? Yeah, I mean, uh, many times levitation, 
not necessary. That's very rare. I have see, seen someone rise off their chair about an inch, but that's the only time I saw that. But I did. I was working with the satanic ritual abuse survivor a few years ago, and uh, when the demonic manifest, he actually rocked back on his chair on the two back feet of the chair to the point where it was impossible for that chair not to fall over. And we, we still went back in the video and went, how's this possible? So he was basically rocking on these, the two legs of the back of the chair, just, just like this without falling over. So I've seen some weird stuff. That's remarkable. Yeah. And I, I thank you for your, your openness and your honesty. You know, you're obviously not the kind of person that sensationalizes this, you know? And so I think that really speaks to your credibility in this area. And I thank you for that. Um, another question that I had for you is there's this sort of debate that goes on about uh, possession, demonization, what kind of language we should be using. And so are there different kinds of possessions that you see and treat um, or is it all sort of one and the same? I think nowadays demonization, possession have been put in the same category. I think it, it just makes it hard to try and separate it. I have preached about this and the word possession is used in the Bible. Uh, the, the centurion servants, when he asked Jesus just to speak a word, says he was possessed by evil spirits. Uh, the, the, the Phoenician woman that came to Jesus when he was eating at the table with his disciples said she was her daughter was possessed. So possession to me is an indwelling of evil spirits at a level between 1% and 99%. Uh, demonization is more affected from the outside. This is just my interpretation. The general Christian world categorize them together. But I've used this example. You could say that politician was demonized by the media. You can't say that politician was possessed by the media. In that sense, they're completely different words. Yeah, that but makes possession, a lot of sense. Possession is the predominant word. You don't actually see the word demonization in the scriptures. You'll see the word possession. That makes sense. And, you know, with... With the uh, whole issue of demonic possession, you know, I had a lady at church asking me the other day about whether or not uh, I believed her son was possessed, you know, and I had to take a really big step back and say, look, I don't really have all the answers. I don't know. But while I've got you here, what kind of signs would you ask someone to look for if they are wondering whether or not a family member or, you know, a friend might benefit from a deliverance ministry? There, there'll be inconsistencies there'll be psychological inconsistencies and just on that point of psychology again Stephen um, certain people do have a predisposition to develop psychological conditions so if, if there's a generation it, it, there in itself even if it's purely psychological and it's generational that's a curse so you can say okay it's just a physical mental psychological condition however if it's generational and there's patterns in the family it's a curse but um you mentioned to me what signs tell you someone has possession that's correct there will be inconsistencies emotionally there will be inconsistencies in their finances they won't be able to hold down jobs they won't be able to maintain relationships um they will rejection and abandonment are very deeply connected with possession. Um, there will be, like I said, many relational issues. Um, there will also be the, the, the main issues, the three that I say, they won't be able to be consistent at church. They won't be able to read the Bible consistently and they will have a very limited prayer life. So the demonic will do everything in its power to stop those three components. Yeah. Well, that makes complete sense. And, and that kind of leads me into another area of discussion that I'm really interested to get your perspective on. In preparation for our podcast, I've obviously been watching other people interviewing, uh, you know, deliverance ministers and exorcists. And I'm sure you see that in the YouTube space, because I know you're on there. Uh, mm. And by the way, I should mention all of Selwyn's links, his book, his YouTube channel, uh, all of the social media that he uses will be linked in the description box below for your convenience, everybody. So you're gonna be able to find him really easily. Um but so as I was looking at these uh, these interviews, I noticed that a lot of the ministers were Catholic, right? And and Catholics, at least in my very limited experience, have a different relation, have a different um, view of exorcism slightly to Protestants. Like I know that they rely very heavily on things like holy water, blessed objects and things like that. And I've yeah. listened to Catholic priests discuss how, whether or not they distinguish a case is... Uh, demonic possession or if it's a mental health issue by using blessed and sacred objects 
and seeing if the person reacts to that. And I have no idea what to think about that. So maybe you could help me think through that, you know, as just a normal evangelical Protestant here in Melbourne, I don't know how to process that. Do you believe that uh, demons do respond to blessed objects, holy water and things like that? And do you use any of those in your practice? Some demons do respond to those, not all demons. But um, if somebody, if something is purely psychological, uh, they, the psychological component will not react to your cross or to the holy water or to oil. And, and sometimes even to prayer. The psycholog psychological condition will sometimes not respond to your prayer in that moment. It might overcome it temporarily and then emerge later. But with the demonic, they will be affected by your prayer. But, but even deeper, on a deeper level than that, if you're walking in your authority, okay, you, you, maybe you don't know your authority and then you're trying to pray against the demonic, you're not going to get any reaction. I've seen, I've witnessed this. But if you're walking in your authority, the Lord has promoted you spiritually and given you authority over that realm, they're going to respond. I use the cross, I use holy water, I use oil, I don't use salt. Um, but I find sometimes Hindu spirits respond to the cross. They don't like it. Um, I find anti-cross spirits, it just depends. You, you can't really categorize it that much, but there are certain demons that hate the image of the cross. And I say there's nothing, I've been accused of this, using the cross. Oh, he's Catholic, don't go to him. And by the way, I'll just say this, I support the Catholics. You know, I'm not a Catholic. I won't convert to be a Catholic, but I support Catholic exorcism because they've maintained that through the centuries and they want to set the captives free. And, you know, remember when the disciples came to Jesus and said, should we stop these people doing that? He says, no, they, if they're not, they're for us. They're not against us. Amen. I see the same thing. So all the people, whatever denomination is doing exorcism to help the captives get set free. I support that. And people that have accused me, I had an email sent to me recently saying, uh, Jesus didn't use objects to deliver people of demons. So I said, I sent an email back. I said, look, there's no power in the piece of metal whatsoever, but what it represents has omnipotent power. So when the demon sees the object, he also sees whether you believe in your authority and the image behind that object. So it comes back to authority. You can hold that cross up with no authority. That demon will just laugh at you. But when you, when I hold that cross up, I actually believe in my spirit holding a weapon against that power. The demon knows that I believe that and therefore reacts to that. That's right. And you mentioned there knowing your authority in Christ as you're, as you're doing that. And one of the questions that I had for you is, are there certain criteria that a Christian needs to have in order to be conducting uh, an exorcism? How do you view that, right? Like, can any Christian do that just because they're indwelt by the Holy Spirit? Or is there some is there something more going on, if you could help me understand that? I think every Christian <clears throat> has authority over the devil. But then the Bible also says, submit yourself to God, therefore, and resist the devil, and he shall flee. So, But I do believe this vocation or spiritual vocation is a calling, a distinct calling. Um, I often have people contact me, Stephen, very often, and they'll say, hey, uh, we've been praying for a family member and we cast some demons out, but there's some demons that just won't go. And then they bring them to me, and then we deal with that and they get delivered. Does it mean I'm better than them? No, but there's, there's an anointing God's put on my life relating to that. And so I've seen it before. I've seen demons don't respond to certain people, and then someone else walks in the room and all of a sudden that that demonic power is on the line and he's getting driven out. So I do believe it's a calling, a specific calling, but I do believe every Christian has the authority to at least through prayer to align their friends or family members in getting set free. But that some strong sense. men, some strong men have a lot of power. Absolutely. And, and when these people are coming to you, are you seeing any sort of common themes in, in terms of what open people up to demonic possession? Uh, is there any particular practice or anything like that that you see commonly in the lives of people that come to you for deliverance? Lack of submission. Um, I could say many things, Stephen. I could say sexual immorality. I could say drug abuse. I could say uh, parents are abandoning their children. I could say incest. I could say a lot of things. 
But this is the thing that has jumped out to me is unsubmissiveness because Leviathan is the spirit I deal with predominantly in Australia. Leviathan is behind pride of the heart and, um, and, and the culture that we're in, our culture, even, even globally, the culture, but I'm living here. So the culture is driven towards independency. I don't need anybody. I do everything myself. I don't need to submit to God. I'll come to God when I need him for something. But at the end of the day, this area of my life, he can't have. And I find that that component is quite consistent that allows, not necessarily allows the demons to enter, but allows them to reside and stay. We, legal rights are a separate issue. That That's usually ancestral. Uh, so they're in the bloodline. They usually come down in the wombs of the children that are born, the descendants. But the strongholds, what I just mentioned, unsubmissiveness is a massive stumbling block to really accessing where that demonic power is in the person's life. And when you mention these particular spirits like Leviathan, I hear people mention Jezebel. One of the things that I'm trying to understand is, is that a particular class of spirit? How do you how do you understand that? Like it's one particular class of spirit that exhibits certain symptoms or um, yeah, well, help me to understand the different sort of classes and, and map that spiritual realm a little bit for people who might not be too familiar with it. Well, from what I've seen, and this, this came later in my ministry that obviously the spirit of Jezebel, there is a single spirit that's, I believe, one of the five princes under Satan but has many uh, minions or clones of itself. Don't ask me how that came about, but it has, I don't know, millions of clones possibly, Jezebel's out there, because we deal with it almost every day. But the thing is, Jezebel is a, is a prince of hell. Leviathan is a prince of hell. I think uh, Asmodeus, Leviathan, Jezebel, Baphomet, Mammon, these are key players in the kingdom of darkness directly under Satan. They've got clones of themselves functioning in the world. And so the symptoms, I, I see Jezebel and Leviathan predominantly in the church area. Jezebel loves power. She loves position. And she loves to pervert true prophecy. And she loves to uh, take focus off Jesus, God, and put it onto man. Whereas Leviathan will be is is more discreet than Jezebel. Jezebel will be quite blatant. She will never hide herself, and and one of the reasons she never gets caught out. People will recognize the behavior, but they will be afraid to expose her. So that's how she functions. And then Leviathan obviously works in the area of unsubmissiveness. I know everything. That makes complete sense. And that's actually really interesting. I like the way that you phrase that with them having uh, almost like clones of themselves. So there's almost like sort of like an archetype of them that we see in the Bible. Like we see Jezebel, for example, in scripture, but then we see that pattern being continued on even uh, up until today. And I asked you this before about the equipment that you use and you mentioned uh, the cross. So, uh, and holy water and things like that. So I can move past that. So another question, and, and this is perhaps the most important question for somebody that's just had a deliverance, is how does somebody remain free after they get a deliverance? Um, it's, I think there's a few things that they can take into consideration. Um, I think the most common strategy is to be in church consistently, uh, be in the Word of God daily, um, have, a, have a life of worship, prayer, you know, as people are going through deliverances, the, that area of their life is slightly breaking open because the demonic would have stopped them doing all those things. So I always encourage them, push through in those areas. If something's telling you, you don't go to church, go to church. And even a lot of the, sometimes I get churches that are aware that I'm ministering to one of their members and, and they, they talk talk them out of coming to me. So what I say to people too, because a lot of people say my church is completely against deliverance. I know I need it. I've already had some freedom. What should I do? I'll say, well, maybe don't go telling everybody what's what you're going through. Just say to some trusted friends, can you pray for me? I'm going through a challenging time. Don't give them too much information because, you know, sometimes when, when there's too much information, it, it ends up sabotaging the process. So I have to deal with all these things. 
But at the same time, I'm supportive of every church, even the ones that are completely against it. Because as the Bible says, whether in envy or strife, Christ is preached. So I I use the body of Christ because even if they're against it, it's still a place where they can come and hear about Jesus. Yeah, absolutely. And it must be uh, difficult for you to see that because, you know, prior to starting this podcast and to having guests coming on uh, who have even spoke of having deliverance since being a Christian, which is another thing that maybe we could get into a little bit is exactly what role the deliverance plays for somebody that, you know, is professing Christ as their savior and their Lord, um, but is still maybe experiencing some spiritual issues. Um, because prior to speaking to people like that, I think I had, I was a lot more closed minded to deliverance ministry, but then seeing the fruit that it's definitely brought people who are Christians, but are still suffering through some of these issues has definitely made me a lot more open to that. So what, yeah. What role do you see deliverance ministry playing in the life of the Christian? You know what I believe, Stephen, you, you know, it's interesting in the Bible, you hear Jesus spoke or they spoke of the five offices, apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, etc. You know, you don't hear of the office of exorcist. And I'd, I believe it developed. This is my belief that it developed when the church uh, never took on that role. So, so I think if every church embraced deliverance, and, and had someone in there because, you know, in the church, you've got helpers, you've got administrators, you've got deacons and you should have deliverance ministers. And I think if every church did have that, I don't believe there would be people working in it in a full time job like me. That's a, a strong possibility. So I think it's I think the deliverance movement is on the rise. As you said, you, you've probably noticed that. And I'm noticing that a lot of churches are opening up to it. Uh, obviously fearful because, you know, people get a bit crazy with this stuff. That's another thing I've, I've noticed is that some people that get into deliverance, they get a bit cuckoo with it. And so I'm always encouraged people just to stay balanced. Don't focus on the demonic. Even when I'm ministering to people that are strong possession cases, they've been so oppressed by the demonic for so long. It's all they can think about. And I'll tell them, I'll, I'll, I'll drum it into them. Don't think about the demonic. Think about Jesus. Focus on the word of God. The demons are secondary to all that. And what the demonic does is it wants people to focus on it. But, you know, my strategy in dealing with churches that are against this is I just try my best to work with them. It's my goal is to work with every church, every deliverance ministry, work together. We're working for the same goal. People want to get set free. Unfortunately, pride gets involved and people get insecure. I find when, when ministers now are ministering to their people and they're seeing huge breakthrough in their people, they feel insecure that, what well, you know, what's happening here? I should be doing this or et cetera, et cetera. So I don't, I don't play on that ego thing. I just try and make pastors feel comfortable. I try and work with them for the benefit of people's freedom. That makes sense. And, and speaking of the benefit for people's freedom, are there, are there certain things that people should avoid as they become interested in deliverance ministry? You already mentioned becoming preoccupied with the demonic and not, and not the godly elements of it. I see, for example, in some of these videos that I've been watching of exorcisms, that the demons can actually communicate with you, the exorcist, in the process of a deliverance. Do you see any dangers there of, of being deceived from these entities as people communicate with them? Do you think they do they try and lie to you or... What do you think their intention is in communicating with somebody uh, who's performing the exorcism? Are they 100% deceptive? They are completely deceptive. They lie. But through experience, through the Holy Spirit giving you discernment, you, you wor I work around that. You know, um, that, Here's an example. So on in Melbourne, obviously I was doing a deliverance on, on a lady and um, – the demonic said to me, "There's thousands." It was dealing with Leviathan. Said that there's thousands here, thousands here. So I said to Leviathan, "This was a strategy I had." I said, "Leviathan, that's too much for me. Uh, that's a lot for me." And he went, "Yes, yes, it is." So I said, "But I've got an idea." And then the spirit said to me, "Don't say his name." I said, "No, I'm not going to say his name now." It's referring to Jesus. He's saying, "Don't say." It. I said, no, I'm not going to say it now. I'm going to say it later. But I've got an idea. Would you like to hear my idea? And Leviathan said to me, no, no, I don't want to hear it. And I said to him, why don't we just bind all those thousands to you? 
So that's strategy for me. You know, feeding into the enemy's own insecurities because demons by nature are insecure. Because you've got to think about it. If you think about the fruits of the spirit, self-control, uh, love, kindness, all those things, they don't have those things. So sometimes I, I, I feed into that. And because every demonic power, especially the higher powered ones, they, they are based in pride. You can use that pride against them. But dishonest, yes, they are. And if you, again, it comes back to this, Stephen, if you are insecure in your authority in Christ, they sniff it. They will smell it within a second and they will use it against you. That makes complete sense. And yeah, I mean, this is some really intense and powerful stuff. I'm looking forward to getting into your book. Maybe just as we wrap up here, you could tell people where uh, they can find you. Uh, what's the best place to find you? My website is um, unseenrealm.me. Uh, YouTube is also under Unseen Realm. And on my website, you know, it, it, I've structured it in a way that, you know, makes people feel comfortable. that They're not thinking, oh, this is some scary thing. And I, I give people as much information as I can. I do this full time every day of the week. And I travel Australia uh, doing private sessions in cities and then ministering in meetings. And so I really feel passionate about helping people get free. That's beautiful. And I know you've written a book. My dad's got your book and I'm actually going to be borrowing that off him very soon. But maybe you could tell me what uh, what I have in store as I read that book. You could speak a little bit about what people can find in that. Well, one of my passions, Stephen, is to, is to in some way be a tool to cross exorcism over with psychology. Because in what I've seen is that you need to understand both. And you can't just say it's only demonization or it's only psychological because that's that's not true either so my my purpose of the book was a few things one was to challenge the christian skeptics um secondly to speak to people who are atheists and agnostics and also to show people that yes we believe there's psychological problems but what demons do is they exasperate those problems they piggyback onto them they anchor to them and they make the situation worse. They use it as a tool to enslave the person even deeper. So, And I used real life experiences in the book. I used some uh, information on mythology, ancient civilizations, the history of exorcism over 2000 years, and just try to build, you know, a type of anthropology for people to use as a reference. That's really that's really fascinating. And do you see uh, sort of mythologies across the world overlapping with these spiritual realities that you yourself encounter regularly? Yeah, because of the ego of the demonic, you know, they they take pride in their mythological stories, and um, they 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 embed a lot of their psychology in those mythological stories. So I often um, go like what recently dealing with the Egyptian stuff. You know, sometimes I, I go back to the mythology dealing with an entity called Set which is in Egyptian mythology. And when you go back and research those um, folklore stories, there's some, some truth to the nature of that particular entity in their mythology. That's really incredible. And uh, you've obviously got such a you know, vast amount of knowledge uh, that people can find uh, you talking about on your YouTube, because I've been listening to a lot there where you go in depth. You've got a lot of your sermons and a lot of your teachings. So I'd really encourage people to check that out. And uh, look, I'm really looking forward to getting uh, into your book and I'm sure I'll have a ton more questions after that. So maybe there'll even be a part two, who knows? But uh, I, <laughs> I really want to thank you for coming on, Selwyn, and uh, for sharing so openly and uh, for your time, brother. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stephen.